Okay, let's continue to the next section, which is a discussion about calorimetry. So calorimetry is a technique that we use to measure the heat of reactions in chemical reactions. So we talked about heat of reactions in the previous section on how a specific reaction, when the bonds are changing from reactants to products, either release heat or require heat in order for that to happen. And we can measure that by measuring the change in the temperature of the surrounding that is around that reaction that's occurring. So to actually do it, we construct this containers that are called calorimeter. And to get the heat of reactions, we set it up pretty much the same way as what I drew earlier, which is that you have a box, you let the reaction go inside the box, and you have a thermometer to measure the change in the reaction surroundings temperature, and then afterwards correlate it back to the reactions change in potential energy. So there are two different types of calorimeters. We call them constant volume and then constant pressure. We're going to start with the constant volume calorimeter. This is basically a metal box that you fill with water and inside that water you have another smaller box that you let the reaction happen inside. Typically this is done for exothermic reaction that is a combustion reaction and that's part of the reason why it's called a bomb calorimeter because the reactions here generally are fairly explosive. These exothermic reactions would release heat to the water that surrounds that smaller container and the whole thing is enclosed, right? So everything is closed off. The only thing that is in there is this little thermometer, which we can look at in terms of measuring the temperature difference of that water at the beginning and at the end of that reaction. So what we're measuring is the heat that is calculated by taking the heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter multiplied by the delta T, the change in the temperature of that bomb calorimeter. What does that heat correspond to? So we start back to the equation with the change in internal energy, which is equal to Q plus W. Of course, Q itself is just the heat and W is negative P external times delta V. Now here's the important part though, the inside container where the reaction occurs. It's set up in such a way where the volume doesn't change. So the size of that container after that combustion occurs is exactly the same as before. So if the volume doesn't change, that means delta V here is going to be zero. We've created this container in such a way where work is not done. So work is being converted to heat. So all we have here is just heat. In other words, when we measure the heat, what we're measuring really is just the delta E itself because delta V is equal to zero. Q sub V is the symbol for heat measured under the condition of constant volume. So this is basically an instrument that's set up to directly measure delta E for a reaction. A lot of times you're going to have a different information being given to you. So you got to pay a little bit careful attention here. There's really two components components that you need to pay attention to. The water and then the bomb calorimeter. And the heat that's absorbed by the water you can calculate by using mc delta t as you did in prior sections. The bomb itself you can also calculate but this one typically would require you to know what the heat capacity is of the metal and other parts of the bomb because the bomb is not a uniform piece usually. It's there's some plastic, there's some metal, there's some glass maybe. And so all of those is then given as one number which is the heat capacity of the whole container. And you just need to multiply apply that with delta T to get your Q. And then you would add those two Qs together to give you the Q of the entire container that is coming from the heat of the combustion reaction. So let's take a look at an example on how to calculate using a bomb calorimetry situation. So here it says that we have combustion of a certain amount of sucrose in a bomb calorimeter which causes the temperature to rise from 24.92 to 28.33 degrees Celsius. Gives you the heat capacity of the calorimeter and then it's asking uh, one is the heat of the combustion of sucrose in kilojoules per mole and then the second is to verify the claim that a teaspoon of sugar has 19 calories in this case food calories. So first thing to think about is just the setup of the experiment. You have a small amount of sucrose 1.01 gram so I'm drawing it right there and that's my bomb calorimeters. You have a container inside a bath of water so that's that smaller container inside is where the reaction is going to happen. In that bath of water, you have a thermometer, which I drew right here, with a certain initial temperature, 2492 in this case. And what you do is you let the combustion reaction take place inside that small container. And now what you have is the products. I'm just changing the color of the drawing to red to indicate that a reaction has occurred. And the temperature of the water bath has now increased to a higher value, 
three because the combustion reaction releases heat to the surrounding and the surrounding in this case is that water bath and the bomb colorimeter components. So how do we get the delta H of combustion per mole of sucrose? The first thing we need to understand is just how much energy is actually released in that combustion reaction in the bomb colorimeter itself. And so to calculate that, we need to calculate heat. And heat, of course, has three different expressions. You can have heat using heat capacity times delta T, MC delta T, and then the less common one, which is the number of moles times the molar heat capacity times delta T. And what you have to do is just choose the one that works best. And what I mean by that is you have to look at the question, see what information is given to you. A lot of times students tend to jump straight to MC delta T because that's the one that they see the most often, but that's not always the case. And here I want to highlight that because in bomb colorimeter examples, we typically don't have the specific heat of the bomb colorimeter. We have heat capacity, and that's what you see here in the question. It says heat capacity. It doesn't say specific heat capacity. So you need to pay careful attention to that because heat capacity is just C. It's not C sub S. Q will be the C of the bomb colorimeter, which in this particular example includes both the water and the components of the bomb times delta T. So if I plug in the numbers that I have, I'm going to get 16.709 kilojoules. Now the Q here is Q of the bomb itself, right? It's not Q of the reaction because the temperature that you're measuring is clearly the temperature of the water. It's not temperature of the combustion that's occurring inside that little container. So what you get there is the Q of the surrounding. What you're trying to get is delta E because we are using a bomb colorimeter. So the relationship between system and surrounding is whatever is in the system is going to be the opposite of the surrounding with respect to the energy transfer. So delta E of reaction is going to be negative Q of the bomb. So the value then is going to be negative 16.709 kilojoules. That 16.709 kilojoules comes from combusting 1.01 grams of sucrose. Question is asking us to calculate per mole of sucrose. A mole of sucrose is a lot more than 1.01 grams, right? Because the molar mass of sucrose is 342.3 grams per mole. So there's actually a huge amount of sucrose in one mole of it. We need to convert the quantity of energy into per mole quantity. So I multiply that by the molar mass, and that would give me negative 5663 kilojoules per mole of sucrose. And you might think like that's a really huge number. And indeed it is. And that's why we use this as one of the ways we power the human body, right? Is by combusting sugar. That's definitely one of the sources of energy that humans use. Now, the second question here asks about the amount of energy that a teaspoon of sugar has, because the uh, producers of sugars in the sugar packet, if you look at it, it will say that one teaspoon has about 19 calories. The question is, is that true or not? Now, you can calculate that because you know that um, in 1.01 grams of sucrose, you have 16.709 kilojoules. So really what you need to do here is just convert it to calorie first. Now, remember that the calorie we talked about here is nutritional calorie, and nutritional calorie is kilocalorie, right? So it's written with uppercase C. The relationship between nutritional calorie and kilojoules is just 1 to 4.184. And then the next thing is you have to figure out, well, how much of it is in a teaspoon? A teaspoon, we were told, is about 4.8 grams. So you're going to multiply that with 4.8 grams. That would cancel out your units the way you want it so that in the end, all you get is calorie. You do get very close to 19 calorie. I think it's 8.95. So it does round to 19 calorie. So in other words, the claim is true. Now let's take a look at the second type of calorimeter that we call a constant pressure calorimeter or sometimes more commonly known as the coffee cup calorimeter. The reason we need to look at this second type of calorimeter is because most chemical reactions are actually not occurring under the condition of a constant volume calorimeter or a bomb calorimeter. Most reactions that happen in your body, for example, or in nature, you know, in plants, animals, uh, open air, all of those actually not occurring under constant volume, right? The volume can change. The, te the reactions occur under conditions of constant pressure uh, because the pressure inside and outside of the container equilibrate with each other, resulting in a constant pressure experiment. What makes more sense to measure is not so much heat under constant volume, but heat under constant pressure. As a result of that, we set up this container called the coffee cup calorimeter, and the setup is fairly straightforward. All you want to make sure of is that there is a way for the container to equilibrate its pressure inside with the pressure outside. You can use a couple of styrofoam cups, uh, combine them together in a container like this, you 
put your reaction in there. So your reaction has both your reactants, which then turn become product, and then the solution, which is the solvent that surrounds the reactants and the products, right? You have a thermometer, you have a stirrer there that would help to get the reaction to go, and then measure what the change in the temperature is. Remember that that change of temperature corresponds to the surroundings temperature, which then you have to relate back to the reaction's heat itself. Now, what exactly are we measuring when we measure this heat at constant pressure, which we give the symbol Q sub P? We go back to our original equation, which is delta E is equal to Q plus W. Now, in this case, we have Q sub P representing the heat because it's measured under condition of constant pressure. And then we still have these negative P external times delta V, which represents our work component. If we rearrange this equation so that Q sub P is on one side and everybody else is on the other side, we notice that Q sub P, which is the heat that we measure in the coffee cup calorimeter, actually represents delta E and the P external delta V component of work. So in other words, this is not purely just delta E. This is a new quantity. It's delta E plus that. So we can't just call this Q sub P delta E, unlike what we did earlier with the bomb calorimeter, we call that Q sub V delta E because that's exactly what it is. Here we have to give it a different symbol. So we call this quantity change in enthalpy or delta H. The uh, reason to give it this name is give the idea that this is a similar quantity to internal energy. It's just that this is heat that's measured under constant pressure. So when we say delta H of a reaction, we are really referring to Q of the reaction, which is something that we had calculated in a previous video, right? And we can calculate Q by taking MC delta T. That will be one way to do it. You can also do it with the other methods that we discussed before. And that should equal to the Q sub P, heat measured under constant pressure, which is of course your delta H of the reaction, okay? The way we do this, as I mentioned earlier, is you usually measure the surroundings temperature. That allows you to calculate the Q of the surrounding. Whatever happened to the surrounding, the exact opposite happened to the system. So we have this relationship here, which is that delta H of the system is negative delta H of the surrounding. And that's how you can get the delta H of the system, which of course is the same as the delta H of the reaction. So the question that we have to ask ourselves a little bit here is, what's the difference between delta H and delta E? Because remember that when we first started thermodynamics, our goal is really to calculate delta E, the change in internal energy when a chemical reaction takes place. Well, notice that delta H is just delta E plus this component right here. So the question then becomes, how big is this value of P external delta V? If it's really big, then delta H and delta E are going to be very different from each other. If it's pretty much zero, then delta H and delta E are going to be identical. Now, for solids, liquids, and aqueous reactions, there is no difference between delta E and delta H. The reason is because delta V here, the change in volume, is because there's an expansion or a compression. If you remember back to our discussion about work, expansion and compression really only occur when you have gases. You don't really have that process occurring if you're dealing with solids, liquids, and aqueous. So if we're talking about calculating delta H and delta E for reactions that occur as solids, liquids, and aqueous reaction, those two numbers are identical, okay? For gases, we're going to need to look at the stoichiometry fairly carefully here, which is to determine how many gas products do we have relative to gas reactants. Why is that important? Because we look back to the ideal gas equation, which is PV equals NRT, except in this case, we're wanting to know what is the delta V. So we can write it as P external times delta V is equal to RT times delta N. So notice that that's still PV equals NRT. The reason there's a change in volume is because there's a change in the number of moles of gas. The change in number of moles of gas is calculated by taking the number of moles of gas products minus the number of moles of gas reactants, okay? If you want to know how different your delta H from your delta E is, all you need to do is figure out what is the RT delta N component, okay? If your delta N is equal to zero, that means your delta H and delta E are exactly equal to each other. So here's a reaction where the gases on the left side, this is a solid, so that doesn't count. Gases is oxygen, and there's 12 of it. On the right side, you have a gas here, and you have a liquid, so liquid doesn't count. So you also have 12 here. So 12 moles, 12 moles, same number of moles, so delta N is equal to zero. What about another situation here? You look at this reaction, you notice that on the left side you have gas here and gas here, so when you add those coefficients together you get three moles. When you look at this one you get two moles. So that means that you are going from more gas to fewer gas. That means there's a compression, so your delta N is negative. This whole thing is a negative number, so if that's a negative number that means your delta H is going to be less than your delta E, because your delta H is equal to delta E minus something. Okay? The third situation is when you have more gas on the product side. So if you look at this reaction here, you 
have three moles of gas on the left, five moles of gas on the product side. Your delta N is positive. So your delta H in this case is going to be greater than your delta E. But the key point to take away here is that in most situations, delta H and delta E are the same. So here's a problem on comparing delta H and delta E value. We just talk about the fact that there's not a whole lot of difference usually between these two values, except for reactions involving gases. And even then, you know, we don't really see a huge uh, amount of difference. So let's actually calculate and see what the actual difference is between delta H and delta E. So we were told that the combustion of carbon monoxide to produce carbon dioxide gives us an enthalpy of combustion of negative 566 kilojoules per mole. And the question is, what's the delta E? Well, you start with the relationship between delta H and delta E, which is given in your notes. Delta H is equal to delta E plus P delta V. And to find out then what your delta E is, you're going to calculate this component P delta V. Remember that that's expansion work, which depends on type of reaction you have, how much gases you have in your reaction. So in this particular case, you have a combustion reaction. So you have CO burning with oxygen gas to form CO2 gas. Everybody is a gas here. Balancing the equation gives me two, one, and two for the coefficient. And so the way we calculate the P delta V is by using the ideal gas equation relating it to delta N R T. Delta N here is the difference in the number of moles between the product and the reactant gases, which is two minus three. Two is the coefficient of CO2. Three is the sum of the coefficients of the gases on the left side, on the reactant side, times R T. R T is just 0.0821. The T here, if it's not given to you, you take the standard T that we use in these type of calculations, which is 25 Celsius or 298 Kelvin. The last step I need to do is to make a conversion because my unit of enthalpy is in kilojoules. If I stop the calculation at the temperature, I would get a unit of liter atmosphere. So I need to make one more conversion, which is a conversion between joules and liter atmosphere. So that allows me to, to cancel out my liter atmosphere, giving me just a unit of joules in the end, which is negative 2478.997 joules. And then the last part here is I need to rearrange my uh, delta H equals delta E equation to look like this now. Delta E is equal to delta H minus P delta V. And then my delta H is negative 566 kilojoules minus my P delta V is minus 2478, but that's in joules. I need to convert it to kilojoules. So it becomes negative 2.478997 kilojoules. When I subtract that, I get a value of negative 563.5 kilojoules. But notice the value of the delta H is negative 566 and the value of the delta E is negative 563.5. That's less than 1% difference in the values of the two quantities. So getting delta H is a lot easier to do. And the value of delta H is a very good approximation of the value of delta E itself.